Thank you very much for joining this um, Legs Matter Lounge session. I'm absolutely um, delighted to be hosting this with uh, Crystal Oldman uh, from the Queen's Nursing Institute. And um, this is just, just lovely and we're gonna have a conversation together. Crystal, are you well? I am, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's well, lovely to be here. It's lovely to have you, especially as this is an important week for the Q&I for your own conference every day this week. So um, well done you for turning up uh, to the event this evening, we much appreciate it. And for your support for the Legs Matter campaign, it's very much appreciated. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to a video about ourselves, we've, we've had a conversation already, but we will be here for the Q&A. And I really encourage um, people attending this session to put questions in the chat box. Know that this is being recorded and we can all go back um, and catch up on it next week, but really appreciate some live questions um, to um, Crystal um, in this event. So uh, with no further ado, we will move over to the video. Thank you very much, Sue. Great. Well, welcome to um, one of the final sessions of the first day of the Legs Matter Conference. Crystal, um, as always, it's just delightful to sit with you and have a natter about, about Legs Matter. And this is an in conversation with you about um, district nursing, really, community nursing in particular, um, and legs, and, um, and about the documents that um, hopefully the listeners will have got hold of and had a read, uh, have their views on that um, in the Q&A session as well. But the important document that we're here to discuss um, is the Legs Matter, um, a case for system change. So welcome, Crystal. It's really nice to have you. Thank it's you. Especially, Lovely especially is this is your conference week. So that's going to be that's a that's an important week for you in the Q and I, isn't it? It is, yes. But equally, um, this is Legs Matter Week. So yeah, a great coincidence that this is all about community and the importance of the nurses' role in the community, keeping yeah. patients safe. Yes, indeed, indeed. And so that's sort of, sort of the focus of our talk today. And um, the Legs Matter consensus document um, has taken us about a year to develop. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of uh, busy things going on in the world that have delayed some of this. But the Legs Matter consensus document has come out from the Legs Matter Coalition. And it's um, I think it's a fairly hard hitting document. It's not something we're used to writing. Um, and I think it needs to be put into the context of other important NHS or healthcare focused documents where people have sat back and thought, hang on a minute, what is this about? And the, the important title of system change is really critical to us. And it may be critical to this discussion really because I think as nurses we're all working really hard mm -hmm. community nursing is really you know working flat out we're all working flat out in healthcare and so to write a document where we say this what's happening is not good enough is a really difficult area I think to look at and to bring critique to our working practices and that's why the title system change, I think, is really important, because what we're saying through the document is, is that it isn't just about that one person that we hear about that's got drippy legs or the one person that hasn't had a diagnosis or an assessment. We've actually got a systemic problem around this group of people. And for community nurses, this is a massive chunk of their work. 50% of their day-to-day -day management will be in wound care, and the majority, probably 50% of that work or more, will be to do with legs. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a difficult area to talk about, but the document, when people look at it, it's, it's setting out some facts 
and we're using language that is hard hitting, I think. So, so we've developed this document and as a team, we were like, who would we like to endorse this document? And I said, Q and I. And, um, and so we asked you and Q and I Scotland for your views on this document. And as I've said to you before, we, we sent that with some intrepidation because of the fact that we have to support our clinicians to deliver care. So we sent this out knowing that some of the language is a bit, it's critical. It's critical of the system that, and the culture in which we work around um, people with legs. So, but we knew that if we were going to have any impact with this document, we had to have key people on board, hence the Q&I, because of course your his, you know, long history of working with community nurses, but, but also because of your important links and your growing links to the whole system and directors of nursing in particular. So with, I've done this preamble, with your background, your long background in q and and your personal background, what was your take on this document that landed tentatively in your inbox? Um, well, I can understand your reticence and thinking, well, this is quite hard hitting the language that's used. Might it be received as a criticism of what nurses are, are currently doing? I'm, as you say, working so hard to keep their patients safe and to do the best possible uh, nursing care, to deliver the best possible nursing care and, and in the middle of a pandemic. But actually, it's a very easy document to read. It's written in language that relates directly to practitioners, uh, to managers, to uh, commissioners, to the whole system. And, and it's, it's not, it's not criticising any individual. It's no. actually saying, look at this. This is the situation that we're all in. We're all in together. And this is what, and it also gives very clear indications guidance of what needs to change and it's it's not opinion based it's absolute facts and i think those facts cannot should not be ignored can't be just can't be this is this is a moment in time for things to change and and the reason um that i really welcomed it no problem whatsoever language is absolutely spot on you can't dance around the handbags on this. This is, it's got to be put in front and center to individuals, to team leaders, to professional leads, to chief nurses, to commissioners, to say, this is what needs to, this is the, this is the problem. You've set out the problem really, really well with all the facts and you've given the solutions. And that really spoke to the q and because we uh, are founded on best practice that's what we exist for to to promote best possible care for people in their homes and communities and we always say that we're a solution focused organization so we don't say here's the problem and then that's it leave it on the table here is the problem here are the facts we always say and this is how we see the solutions um, being uh, implemented and that's what you've done in the document so I, I thought it was a great read, a very uh, straight, uh, very hard to read actually, and um, and and there's there's one story in there that's um, it's called Sue's story, I think. Yeah. That, yeah. That really, really stays with me. It really resonates, um, and I think what? Sue's story will be recognised by any nurse in the community in a a district nursing team that has that has cared for an equivalent Sue on their caseload. Um, and it, it's those human stories that you remember, I think, as well. So having that balance in the document of here are the facts, here are the solutions, and here's a human story. It's really, really good. It's really interesting you should say that because I, I'm a lover of data, but I'm a lover of making data relevant to the local area. And, and the thing is, we can, we can know this 
the big numbers around it. There's lots of publications recently that talk about, you know, the, the billions spent on wound care and so on. But what we don't have as nurses is our own local data. Um, and because it doesn't automatically fall out of system one or EMIS or whichever system people are using. And so we, we're often in the dark. And so we, we think that we've just got this one person that is like, you know, um, drippy legs and the story that goes with that patient is, we've tried this and we've tried that and whatever. Um, and, and, and people would have done, but if they knew that actually that person and their experience was actually replicated thousands of times today um, across the UK. Does that make a difference to our approach to this person? You know, to, to recognize that we think we've done everything we can, but actually it's it's not quite true. There's a there's a culture around leg ulcer management that inhibits us from providing therapeutic compression, good compression that works because it does work, but often people are in light compression. There's this whole story around that. Um, and, and, and there's this, there's this phrase, it's a really interesting one, that some compression is better than none. And, and it's a funny thing. And, and we, and so in Legs Matter, we try and talk about compression as a dose, as a therapeutic dose. So it isn't just a bandage and a little bit is better than none, because you would never say about paracetamol or, you know, steroids even, or oh, a little bit is better than none, right? <laughs> so, so we're trying to change the way people talk about this, um, uh, sort of sidelined, even though it's half our workload, it's it's sort of a, a Cinderella sort of type service. Um, and so what, what I hope that when people read Sue's story is that something here resonates for them to hold that document in their hand and go, ah, okay, I have to, I can do something with this within the handover discussions with my line manager, and with my director of nursing and go, actually, I thought there was something that could be done about this, but I'm keep being told there isn't anything can be done, but actually maybe there is, you know, there is hope for change. Yeah. Um, so that resonating is an interesting one for you. Um, and, and of course, what's, what's your background, Crystal, for those that don't know? Oh, right. So I'm not a district nurse by background. Um, okay. I'm, <laughs> I am a, um, but my first, my love of wound care, my first uh, job as a qualified uh, nurse was on a burns and plastics ward where there was, as you imagine, a huge amount of wound care. I love wound care and I love that it's the nurse's role, it's the nurse's job. Yeah. It's our knowledge, our skills, and there, I can't think of any other healthcare professional that has the knowledge and skills around wound care that we have as nurses. Um, so my love of wound care developed there and the teaching that I had around wound care was from the nurses who were more senior than me, um, the sister and the senior staff nurses. And I learned so much about wound care in that time. I was there for a year um, and I remember a, a very new, um, what we would call a, a house officer in those days, Yes. coming onto the ward and telling me how wound care needed to change with a particular patient and I knew it did and I had the knowledge and skills to know exactly what was right for that patient and um so that that was I think was was probably uh, I remembered it all of these years later uh at the, with this uh, with the doctor telling me that he knew more than I did and I was then able to say no I know this 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 and this and this is why uh, this is appropriate intervention and treatment for this wound. Hmm. That, <laughs> and and I think that's um, so. Then that that so that was my experience of of wound care and the importance of nurses' knowledge and skills and confidence in being able to say no. I know what's right here, and this is what your document has done as well. The coalition document says gives permission um, to view the intervention, the compression as a treatment that is in the nurse's 
um, gift to be able to intervene, to be able to do this work and for it not to be, I love your description of not a little bit of steroid or a little bit of antibiotic. It's actually, this is, this is the dose. This is what needs to be done. Actually, this is the minimum dose yes. for everybody. And, and this is nursing knowledge based on evidence and it's safe with mm. the parameters that you've given, it's safe. Yeah. And I think that's, that's really helpful. This is nursing. This is what nurses do, our knowledge and competence to be able to do this work. So my, my work then after, after that was in intensive care and then into the community. And I trained as a health visitor in the days when health visitors were uh, cradle to grave or as I like to call it, sperm to worm. Um, so that you did, you were there for the whole community. It's, it's a very different role now. We were focused on children and families. So, but we, I also had an, um, a caseload of older people um, in the local area too. But my, my knowledge and skills around wound care certainly diminished after that time, but not my passion for it, my passion to support others to deliver best possible care. I mean, you, you're here as an organisation to, you know, to really look at the workforce challenges we have. That's obviously one of the most critical areas of your work at the moment, trying to understand what um, good looks like, what's the standard for delivery, how many people is feasible in a day when, you know, and is a seven and a half minute appointment ever something that you can do, um, and so on and so forth. And, um, and, and I think what we're trying to do as a coalition is to show how that can merge. You know, if you've got overwork and half your caseload or your activity in a day is wound care, how can we do that better to make everyone's lives easier? And um, and so so often people don't think they're related. They just need to get through the tasks. And um, and compression is a dose. It is a therapeutic treatment that can go on and create significant change the exciting thing about um compression therapy is it's one of the rare things that you can put on in effect change incredibly swiftly and that's why those that love managing people with leg ulcers is because they understand that that their hands their head head what they do creates immediate change um and uh and of course um reduces workload because healing rates go up it's it's yeah. re it, it's simple but complex because we're talking about a system change here. So, it, you know, it's interesting you were saying about the nurses. I suppose one of the things I would say is that um, general practitioners need to not think it's all over there and it's all being done. They have a responsibility to know when someone's non-healing or they've got repeated cellulitis and the GP is sending them into hospital with terrible cellulitis. They come out and there's no compression going on. They have a responsibility to understand the harm related to that cycle as well. Um, and, and I think there is a tradition and why wound care is sidelined is because it isn't considered a medical specialty. So we have that problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I can I can see that, and it's all part of a, a kind of culture change, isn't it? Of of a, there's a kind of acceptance that, um, uh, and and you speak about this in the document, an acceptance that oh well, this is the this isn't healing. Never mind, we'll just keep going in day after day, week after week, month after month, sometimes year yeah. after year. Yeah. How how can we that that so that's the what we need to change is that kind yeah. of acceptance both as you say in the in the uh, general practice world um but also within nurses who don't know what they don't know about no. wound care. and one you of the just, things that go. that we've spoken about before part of part of my career has also been in a university when i first went to the university in the mid 1990s we had a professor of tissue viability we had tissue viability, whole top up degrees in tissue viability, which would now be a master's program. Um, we had uh, modules on tissue viability and uh, that, that were taken by community staff nurses if they had a particular interest, or actually, it's part, as you say, 50% of what you do as a staff nurse and district nurse team. So they were coming to learn about this and learn about um, compression bandaging. By the time I left the university, in um, 2012, there was no professor of tissue viability 
there were no tissue viability modules and um, that really worries me i mean we it, it's interesting if you were talking with um george uh, from our team we we talk about this <clears throat> endlessly she's the director of education and accelerate and getting uh, enabling people to attend study leave and to attend these courses people want them but honestly it's a major problem actually you can hold these you can have a block booking and one or two turn up we have you know so i think again you know back in my day we had more access um it was it was considered part and part a parcel of your week to have additional training whilst now it's like can you squeeze it in can you have a 20 minute top up as if that's going to change the system it's not we mm. need we need leaders in the system and not to dabble we need system leaders um and that needs uh, more time than um a 20 minute um freebie you know um we need concerted effort around people understanding that this isn't just a task that it actually affects um, the whole of the system of care um, mm. and workforce our capacity and demand um, and all this so it's um it's an interesting um area to to look at um how, how do you think we can share this you know i was thinking you know i'm part of your um cnen um chief nurse network um, which is a, a fabulous, you, you know, the sessions we have are fabulous, aren't they? And and again, workforce capacity demand is a major uh, piece of work there. How can how can we share this with directors of nursing where they have a lot on their plate too? Yeah, I I, I agree, and and they have a um, huge list of priorities and are constantly day by day reprioritizing. If it's Alison, we've talked before about this being sold as a part of the solution to the workforce challenges that we've got. The document is really clear about how capacity can be released by a different approach to yeah. um, leg management, to wound care. Um, and so there's a bit that's about the education first and being able to know that what you're doing and have the confidence as we said before that this is safe and that this is you're really going to see some great results here and have that um support and wrap around support and a go-to place if you're worried about what you're doing um so so partly it's about that but the selling the selling part is this will not only it's not of course it's about resources but actually it's about giving patients people that are being cared for the treatment that they deserve and the interventions that they deserve to reduce pain, to reduce harm, because we are not deliberately causing harm. And this is where I think the document is hard hitting and quite rightly, but harm is allowed to happen because the right care intervention is not taking place. Mm. And if it does, time will be released and then there'll be greater capacity within the teams. And the evidence is there that this is what will happen. The healing rates, the healing rates are the reduced, so the reduced number of weeks required, it, the evidence is all there, which means that the teams that the chief nurses are responsible for will no longer be spending the amount of time that they do on that. So therefore there's capacity. So yeah, I think there's that, there's that, but I think there's also the professional lead. So the, the um the chief nurses have such a huge responsibility for so many things this will be probably devolved to the professional leads so the, and i know you are, are you come to the national district nurse network the ndnn and have spoken with them so here's a group of professional leads for district nursing who will be the vast majority of them are district nurses by background will have done this work maybe some of them are still doing that work as professional leads with wound care and uh, that you'll be speaking their language. Uh, so then they're then perhaps they're the ones who can be um, providing the evidence to the chief nurses to say we need to work differently. We need the education. We need the training for the nurses to work differently, and we need to collect the data to demonstrate what we've done, both for the for the people that we serve to show 
the difference that we're making uh, and to the GPs to show the difference that we're making by this different approach and then being able to give the measurement of how much time has and resource has been yeah. released yeah and and fundamentally as you use the word confidence there are two things one we need confidence in the this um, treatment compression treatment and the national wound care strategy will go a long way in that uh, i think um, there's going to be more edu uh, education available but also with the early intervention of mild compression as a first line without the doppler i think is a bit of a game changer and i really hope that will also help people's confidence that they'll go oh this is safe to put on Ooh, you know um and uh, without a doppler within the parameters so that's confidence building too um and somehow we do have to have the data to show the change because we we build on that ourselves personally don't we you know we know that something's worked so we'll do it again um and and i think also i would encourage all the the champions of this particular subject um, in district nurses that are listening to not underestimate the ripple they can have on their colleagues. So you'll have some people who, you know, are adventurous and buy into this straight away. And there'll be others that go, I've seen it all before. Let's be honest, it's not going to change anything. Um, and you know, Mrs. Jones, what can we do? Um, and, and then someone will come in and, and change Mrs. Jones's life and people will stop and listen and watch and learn. And so that ripple effect that we can have as, as nurses, community nurses, beyond our little um, boundaries, I think is really powerful to deliver some confidence building material for people. And having that, it just made me think, having that story that goes to the board as well, having that story, so having a story about Sue, Mrs. Jones, yes. that says, look, this, That's this, true. this lady was on our caseload for the last year. We've now, in, we've now undertaken the treatment that we perhaps should have done a year ago and now look she's no longer a patient of ours yeah. here's the story this is what we did this is what we should be doing for all of our the people that we serve all of our patients should have access to this yes. treatment yes um, and i shall never forget um alison when you came and spoke so it was just before lockdown it was february 2020 and you came to speak to our first care home nurse network yes. group um, yes. meeting and uh you came and spoke about exactly this about having the right into uh, right treatment right intervention at the right time and the nurses in the room were saying oh my god i didn't realize you could do that that mild compression straight away without the doctor you can do that and and there was that there were what, about 70 people in the room who were just blown away by what you were saying because they they hadn't had that latest up-to-date information it was based on what they might have been told during their training as a nurse and what they'd learnt as from uh, word of yes. mouth rather than having um mm. the wound care uh, education as as used to happen yeah. back in the day and um and and you immediately gave them the confidence to go away and change practice mm. the next day i remember that session because we it was just before lockdown so it was all really it was already beginning to feel weird going into London type thing. Um, but I remember one um, leader saying that it had opened her eyes to realizing that what she was seeing was harm rather than just wet legs. It was harmful. It wasn't necessary. And she said, I feel, I think she even may have used the word ashamed because she hadn't seen it like that. But, yeah. but we've done that a lot with different things. This is not new. And we did it before with pressure ulcers and, and you yes. would have had it where it was acceptable to be able to get your fist into someone's hip ulcer, right? Because it wasn't seen in the same way. So I hope that what this document does is take some scales off our eyes to go, oh, okay, oh, ooh, heck, okay. I think I can see this differently. So to have different conversations, to bring a different challenge to the people that they are nursing right now and to see it differently and then to see what comes of that mm. to change our language and if people one of the things that we try and not use is the term non-compliance because this is ignorant on our part 
there's uh, we haven't even got time to go into this particular subject but um it's harmful our our flippant use of that language is harmful because it stops us from thinking there is anything we can do and the first thing we need to think about is how the system is stopping them from not tolerating the 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 um, compression that they have and it could simply be that a nurse has put it on wrong that it was uncomfortable but other people put it on right and we all know those stories to be true so mm -hmm. it's easy to label people if we move away from that and think what else can we do to help this person tolerate this dose right we wouldn't just go no oh, they they hate analgesia what can you do right um you wouldn't have that conversation and so we have to challenge the language mm. to create change here yeah so yeah, no I, I absolutely uh, absolutely agree and that's part of the culture change isn't it the language that we use and the presumptions around the use of compliance and, and all the implications that go with that when you say compliance yeah it's very um, powerful very powerful and that's um and changing changing culture as we know takes time but actually the document says this is urgent this is an urgent issue and if we get it right can you imagine the satisfaction of nurses i think that's the other thing about wound care that i remember and uh, you know any opportunity i get for wound care obviously now i take um <laughs> well the satisfaction of seeing seeing a wound heal and that knowing that you have played a significant part in that as mm -hmm. a nurse Mm. with the decisions that you made with the treatment that you gave and seeing the wound heal is is tremendously personally professionally satisfying and seeing the pain diminish from the person that you're taking care of seeing the legs that were dripping no longer dripping is is so satisfying um a personal story my husband um took the front of his shin off entirely um by slipping down um uh, the, the front of a, a board, a scaffolding board, with a metal on the end of it. Ooh. And he just took, took his off. Well, can you imagine the satisfaction of dealing with that wound? That was only <laughs> a couple of months ago. And and cleaning it up and then seeing it heal. Um, so still quite a nasty scar today. And I think it will probably be a very, very vulnerable area for probably yeah, the yeah. life now. Yeah. Um, so it's about 10 inches long. Um, but it, it was blood everywhere. Uh, but it's great to be able to get my hands on some wound care, but and and, and to be able to see it heal. Yeah, I mean, he it was does, just yeah. you know putting a bit of Kleenex on it, and you know, that will be fine, won't it? No, I don't think so. So you know, all the cleaning and the disinfection and all of that was just joyful. Um, so so I think nurses who work in the community who spend a lot of their time, as you said, around fifty percent of your time on wound care, this can be so so satisfying and a complete game changer it is it 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 taps into our need to fix people up doesn't and, it uh, and wounds care is very good at that that's for sure uh lymphedema is more of a long-term uh issue um yes. but but helping people manage their their lifestyles and their condition is um key to that as well so i don't want to lose that one um and the, oh, and well, the Sorry, well, Addison, I was yeah. just going to say about the power of the numbers, and you're saying you love data. Yeah. I think in your doc, in the document, the the figures that you give for the percentage of the population that this involves is huge. Mm. Three quarters of a million people mm. every year mm. is is I think you it's one point five percent of the population. Yeah, um, like develop a leg ulcer every yeah. year yeah. that's huge huge number that nurses are dealing with day in day out um and and the harm that could potentially be an outcome of that is enormous too so look at the difference that we can make with a huge percentage of the population yeah. um so i think those figures and the figures around that we've got at the moment around uh, the, the 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 wounds not healing and the work that is done year, as we were saying before, week on week, month on month, year on year, and and being able to capture that data locally is is 
so satisfying. Could be so satisfying. Could be so satisfying, absolutely. Well, I mean, as our conversation has developed, you know, what, what really thrills me about this is this is Legs Matter Week and lots of people will be online, but more people will probably catch up on this one. And so we're going to have a conversation afterwards um, for Q&A, but I just want to thank uh, the Q&I for your support of, of this uh, campaign, of the coalition, um, and for truly believing that legs do matter uh, in, um, for our, the population we're here to serve, but also for our workforce. And, um, uh, you know, we will obviously talk about how we can make sure this document goes out to all the nursing teams. Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll speak offline about that, but um, really appreciate um, the conversation with you um, today. Thank you so much. And um, thank you for your inspiring work personally, Crystal, as well. Thank you. Thank you, Alison, and, and absolutely a pleasure to be here, pleasure to support Legs Matter Week and a joy and a delight to work with you too, Alison, and, and to continue this conversation beyond this um, conversation today about what more that we can do. Um, as I said before, we are focused on best possible care in the community, and this document speaks to making that happen for Legs. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal. Much appreciated. Well, um, I mean, it's so intriguing. You're still in inches, Crystal. You, you were saying 10 inches for your husband's wound. We'll, we may need to do a quick calculation of centimetres for that. <laughs> well, that was uh, showing my age, clearly. <laughs> uh, it's showing your experience. It's fine. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. It was quite interesting um, reviewing that. We've got um, a few people making comments, so um, if I can draw people in as soon as possible so we can make the most of this. Um, uh, one nurse has said um, that she hasn't read the, the document yet. I've put the, inf the link in the chat box as well for people. Um, and also you can find it on the Legs Matter website um, on the um, up news and updates um, about this particular document for those listening as well. Um, but she was wondering about reviewing her patients on the caseload because she's realised that quite a few are in reduced compression. Um, so um, uh, I think that's an absolutely fantastic place to start, Kirsty. I oh, know it's Hannah, Hannah, Hannah Smith. Um, uh, the interesting thing about reduced compression is that I think it probably came in more for the nurses than for the patients themselves. Um, if we if we do, I'm a bit of a um, I repeat myself here, but regarding paracetamol, you know, it is you take two tablets. If you were taking half a tablet, no one would everyone would wonder why um, you were surprised it wasn't working. So the same goes for the dose of compression. So I would definitely recommend that you review your compression levels. Um, and, um, and it, you know, you can get more information on that and seek support from senior staff as well um, around that and have the confidence uh, to know that this important therapy needs to be given at a higher level if it's going to be effective and reduce um, exudate and pain. It's anti-inflammatory. Um, and so you can always drop me a line, Hannah, as well, if you want to know more. Um, but reviewing the caseload and workload, you know, a stronger compression will reduce that. So, Crystal, have you any top tips for Hannah as she reviews her caseload? So um, interesting, I don't know, Hannah, whether you're a, a, a district nurse or whether you're a staff nurse, um, but I think that starting the conversation with this whole team, the team that you work with, I think that's a good starting place. And of course, I, I know you've, you've started your uh, question or your comment with it, you haven't read the document. I think if you can read the document before you start to have that conversation and then encourage yeah. your colleagues, because all the evidence is there. 
Oh, thank you, Crystal. Um, we've got Margaret uh, Snedden from the British Lymphology Society as well, and she's just um, making a comment here about the position statement on vascular assessment when Doppler is not possible. So for some people, um, Hannah and others, when you've got very wide legs, it's not possible to do a decent Doppler. And um, in which case the BLS document, and again, the link is in the chat, is a very useful uh, framework to work within. And we can be bold when you've got a very wide leg uh, because the, um, the compression is definitely reduced as the leg gets wider. And so if you've got a very wide leg, you're probably only tickling it with compression if you're um, um, applying reduced compression. Um, we've got a, a question about um, the growing problem that we have in this area. What key changes would you like to see? Oh, and, and Hannah said she is a district nurse. So great for you, Hannah. Join the Q&I. Um, uh, what about this growing problem? What key changes would you like to see? Have you any thoughts on that one, Crystal? Well, listening to back to our conversation just then, I, I could... Uh, it was my exasperation, I think, that I was um, just quite mindful of. It's like, but the evidence is there. Why aren't we changing? So I'm a little bit impatient as you get older and you see that there's less time available for you to, <laughs> in your <laughs> lifetime, to see the change. You do. I get quite impatient with when the evidence is there, when, when life could be so much better for so many more patients. So what I'd really like to see is that that nurses are talking about this and are not only talking about it but are owning it and saying this is ours we can make the change just like i was saying to you before about my very first ward that i was on this is our area of expertise no other clinician has this as their area of expertise so we need to make the changes we always say that we are evidence-based practitioners here's the evidence and it starts with, just like Hannah was saying, starts with those conversations, starts with reading the evidence, getting familiar with it, reading the document, seeing what needs to be changed, and then starting to have that conversation. Might be that conversation with your team, because we all are in this together, seeing our patients in the team. But it's also about then having the conversation with the professional lead. If you need to change practice in one team, it's probably going to be across the whole organisation, not just one team. So it's finding out what others do, getting them passionate about it, getting the conversation going with them about making a, that we, 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 I don't think could possibly say this is what's got to change in your area because every area is constructed differently and the structure of the decision-making is, is different. But if we as nurses, with our evidence-based autonomous practice, know what needs to be changed, then we should be making those contacts and having those conversations with our, uh, with our managers. And making those changes ourselves, because we are autonomous. I think that's a really um, good point. It sort of reminds me from <laughs> when I got involved in leg ulcers was when I was a district nurse and I was responsible for my caseload. And I realised that I hadn't a clue, to be honest, about leg ulcers. So I read a few articles and we're talking late 80s here. So there weren't many around. There certainly weren't any guidelines available. But I remember going to my manager and going, I don't understand why we're not doing this. This seems really straightforward. And I think I had two articles to refer to. And so I just said, I think we should be doing this. And that's how my journey started. So everyone needs to understand what their role is in creating change. And firstly, it's to believe it's possible. If you don't believe it's possible, then, then you, you'll get absolutely nowhere. So, um, and it's also, I think, when we're talking about this consensus document, a call to action, is to agree that, the, that what is happening is not right, that it's not right, and it's not right for those patients, but it also is not right for our workforce. It's debilitating, it causes moral distress, to use Professor Alison Leary's description, which I think is fantastic. Moral distress for district nurses. You cannot go in daily to someone with dripping legs, without feeling distressed by the end of the week, if you're not creating any change, it's impossible. So knowing that that actually can be stopped, that tap can be turned off, is powerful in our hands. And it's just, uh, I think, our belief. 
And for those that haven't read the document, please look at the document. I'm just going to read the first paragraph. And it says, a story in section one, a story of complicit failure. Every day, the quality of life for thousands of people is compromised by the lack of support and advice on the prevention and management of lower leg and foot conditions. This can be compounded by a failure to provide the correct diagnosis and treatment. For patients, this can mean months and possibly years of a potentially unnecessary pain and suffering. For healthcare practitioners, this is a continuing trend of failed management results in hours of activity with no tangible end in sight, either for them or the patient. This is why we were referring to this document as fairly hard hitting. And some of those words, we use the word failure, uh, we use the word compromise, we use complicit. It's strong words. When I don't think as nurses we're used to using them, are we, Crystal? No, oh, and the, the other, you might have said it, the other word is harm. Mm -hmm. We're actually doing patients harm by not providing the correct intervention. And that's quite hard hitting as well, because to do no harm is part of our code. We don't do harm as nurses but unknowingly we are doing harm and, yeah. and the, the document clearly says that yeah um we've got someone asking for um a question if there was one thing you'd recommend to change practice from tomorrow what would it be oh wow go on that you you tell you say you are the oh. expert one thing one thing would be to look at those that are receiving treatment, they're on the books, <laughs> for either a daily wet leg dressing or three times a week. They're the easy ones to change because they need stronger compression. If people are soggy, basically there's not enough compression to turn off the tap. There's only a few people within a caseload for whom it would be dangerous to do stronger compression. And those are where they have unstable heart failure or they're really palliative and life is not looking good but for everyone else there are going to be very few people who we can't turn up the dose to create the change we need to see that would be my one thing so to, going back to Hannah's comment about reviewing the caseload finding the quick wins tomorrow and that ripple effect on the team is quite powerful you know, they'll all start going, oh, did you see so-and-so? They were on daily. How did that happen? That's a powerful story. That would be my one uh, recommendation. So so do we want Hannah to come back to us? <laughs> yes. Hannah, let us know how yeah. you get on. Yes. And yeah. the other thing about arterial disease, people are terrified because we've taught them well to be really worried about putting compression on the leg. Unfortunately, it's gone a little bit uh, too far. So people are really worried that if they put stronger compression on, that they will be accused of harm by um, compression damage or putting it on the wrong person. So there is a small chance of that, but there's far higher chance of having soggy legs without putting the correct compression on. But the number of people with true ischemia and critical ischemia is probably less than seven or eight percent of the whole caseload. And so whilst we have to assess for that, don't let it stop you um, from looking at the larger legs that are well perfused and treating them with compression. Using your critical thinking, your risk assessment and reading some of the documents on legs matter, go to the BLS um, document on uh, using um, compression where you can't get an ABPI and so on and so forth. Um, we have terrified people into doing nothing rather than doing something critically. Um, and I think that might be a nursing thing, unfortunately. I think we're a little bit risk averse. Yeah, I, I, do, I do absolutely agree, Alison. Going back to one of the things that I said in, in when we had our our chat about this was about education yeah. and training because what what also gives the nursing profession confidence is that they have learned they've been assessed as being competent and so they change practice so where's that going to happen 
sorry, that's me asking yeah. you a question. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I think it's a again, we've gone so far down someone signing you off as competent mm. that uh I'm not the best person to ask on this because I'm a bit more of a rebel. Um when I started in Legos there was no framework there was no guidance um I remember phoning up Huntley who did uh, the the probes for the Doppler and just going I have no idea about this result what do I do with this that was that was what it was like uh, for some of us starting out in this and so we we sought ways of being creative um in and weighing up what we're thinking and feeling and I think when I talk with nurses they go oh I didn't know I could do that I said but did you think that was a problem well yes I did but I didn't think I could go anywhere with that and there's a lack of um, confidence in nursing to use their judgment their clinical judgment um, because they're terrified of of being labeled as being difficult or of doing something wrong they're terrified of doing something wrong, even though doing nothing is creating dripping legs. That for some reason that doesn't, or weeks and months of treatment isn't perceived in the same way. And I, I'm not an academic in this subject, but I see it and feel it. And there's probably some theory around this <laughs> that I'm not aware of, um, but, somehow we have to encourage the building of confidence in using compression as a therapeutic, powerful intervention. And somehow we've lost it by scaring the wits out of people for um, causing an amputation. Yeah. Um, and we've gone out of kilter. So, so are there, Alistair, are there, are there um, online um, education, professional development, opportunities that, that nurses could undertake so that they could learn more about this and see it being done? I think it's um, in most community trusts will have training programmes on leg ulcer management. The problem is, is that it's overlaid with um, a structure that doesn't allow people to be creative or to... Um, Think that the person in front of them is not standard so standard care is x but the person actually is is not responding to standard care um so um so often you know you just hear stories uh, from the clinicians about the fact that they can't deviate from either the local guidelines even if the patient is not responding to them in in a healing way um, and and I think the um, leadership is sometimes lacking because they see this as some kind of task. As long as we're, we're seeing them and we put something on their legs, we must be doing OK. But the critique that we need to bring is if they're not responding, how does the education respond to that? And it doesn't because we try and standardize standardize you know we're really into that in nursing aren't we and um for good reason in some areas but this is where it doesn't necessarily help us um in accelerate we run um quite a few different courses to help bring critique to compression therapy um and the way people can um have confidence in this powerful um therapeutic intervention um the National Wound Care Strategy are also going to be bringing out um, some online training tools, which I believe will be very beneficial. But we need to move people from, we need to find local leaders. We need to find local champions. So everyone knowing a bit is great, but we need some people to see the bigger picture. Not necessarily tissue viability nurses, but champions, community staff nurses, they can be the greatest champion um, because they're there on the ground they see what's needed so so I think there's education and there's also just motivational stuff yeah and what could be more motivating than seeing the people that you're taking care of 
with their wounds healing because of the work, the difference that you've made, you've changed practice. Mm. And there be people that don't need, eventually don't need your care anymore. How amazing would that be? Yes, absolutely. So I think I'm just looking at this. There's no more questions at the moment. If let me just check. Um, yeah, and people are always asking if it's going to be recorded, and yes, it is. Um, and um, so this will be live next week, I believe, um, so that people can um, uh, link to it and we'll tweet and whatever it, uh, Facebook it. And um, uh, But I, I will just sort of finish up with saying a big thank you to you, Crystal. Thank you very much for your support. And I encourage people to look at the document. We'll, we'll link um, put that link again in, on the website um, and just thank you thank you for your contribution and um, for coming especially during your conference week I was so mindful of that we're clashing Ab a little absolute pleasure absolute pleasure to be here if it makes if it helps and it it helps one patient yeah have, it, have different care that improves their the outcomes for them then I'm so yeah. happy to support everything that you do Alison thank you that's fantastic and I'll leave the the last comment to Hannah thank you both I want to be the champion for this in my area I'll read that document as soon as possible Hannah drop me a line I'll be more than happy to help you be a champion uh, brilliant um thank you very much that was a nice lovely note to end on thank you thanks very much Crystal and thanks to the Legs Matter team <laughs>